Welcome to Genomics Light. It's our new season, the 23-24 season. Um, today we're going to be looking at exploring genome function with uh, Gareth Gerling, uh, technical specialist at the Wellcome Sanger Institute. Um, just some really boring sort of house rules, but obviously our, our events are, are there to help everybody ex, uh, sort of explore the science of genomics. Um, people might have different views on certain uh, topics, so we just ask that everybody um, respects any different views or different questions that might come out in the Q&A. Um, this, this platform is being moderated, so, uh, so that it's uh, safe and, and inclusive for everyone. Um, and this just might answer some of the, the uh, questions around uh, a Zoom webinar, if nobody has used uh, a Zoom webinar before. Uh, so this is what you should be able to see. You, will, you, you won't have your videos on or your microphones on, um, but there will be a chat function and a closed caption function and a Q&A function. So if you have any technical issues during the talk today, anything's not working how it should be, some, you can't quite hear us or anything like that, um, just uh, message myself in the chat and I'll be able to sort that out. If anyone would like uh, subtitles with this talk tonight, um, the closed caption button is the area that you should go to. Um, you should be able to just click that button and it will uh, put up um, live captions uh, today. Um, it will do its best when we're talking about biological and uh, genetics and genomics type subjects, but it might not be perfect. It's just worth saying uh, it is doing it live. And then the Q&A function uh, we'll get to later on. But if you have a question that comes up whilst you hear anything during the talk today, um, Feel free to pop your question in when you think of it, because uh, that way we won't, won't miss it when we get to the Q&A part of the talk. Um, and there'll also be some interactive elements with polls and stuff like that during, during the session. Um, so yeah, we'll look out for those. This is where we're based. So we are based at the Welcome Genome Campus in South Cambridgeshire. Um, as I said to people just joining, um, hello to anyone who hasn't joined a genomics site before. If you've uh, uh, familiar with the uh, genomics like you you will sort of hopefully uh, recognize uh, where we're based but if not yeah we're based at this this campus that you can see pictured here um there are a couple of organizations on the campus we've got the welcome sanger institute and embol ebi um today we've got gareth from the welcome sanger institute uh, going to speak uh, to you um so this is the um this is the sort of uh, step up of, of uh, genomics light. So we'll we'll have a talk from Gareth, then there'll be time for Q&A and we'll be wrapped up by uh, half five. It is being recorded and the session will be available on uh, YouTube and our website. So if anyone has to duck off at uh, sort of at any point during the, the talk, you will be able to, to catch up uh, on that bit. I realized that I don't know if I actually introduced myself, but my name's Sam. I'm one of the science engagement officers at uh, Welcome Connecting Science. Um, and it's lovely to have you all here with us this uh, this afternoon. Um, so I will stop sharing now and I will hand over to Gareth to introduce himself and go through what we're going to be looking at today. So let me stop sharing and hopefully, uh, yeah, hand over to Gareth now. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, it's really great to be here and um, having the opportunity to talk to you all. Um, all right. Can everyone can you see my screen? Okay, good. Right, excellent. So, yeah, like I said, it, I'm Gareth. It's really great to be here today and talking to you a little bit about um, how genomes function and how we explore how genomes function. So, as Sam said, um, when my slides move, if they move, Right. Oh, there we go. <laughs> they have moved. Yes, they finally moved. Thank goodness. Um, so, as Sam said, I'm a technical specialist, but I'm a, a specific type of technical specialist at Sang Institute. I'm a cell and molecular biology technical specialist, and I work in the generative and synthetic genomics program at the Work of Sang Institute. Um, there are a few photos of me in the lab. One on the left, I'm picking bacteria. One on the right, I'm um, culturing human cells. Um, so. I've been at the Sanger for about 12 years now, um, but I've had quite a varied career prior to this. So um, the first five years of my career were spent 
uh, working in accountancy. Then I got as far as being a part qualified accountant before I realised accountancy really wasn't for me. Um, so the opportunity came up for me to uh, go back to university. Um, and I studied cell and molecular biology after university. I then um, spent some time, spent a couple of years working um, at the pharmaceutical company, GlaxoSmithKline, uh, where I worked on small molecular screening um, before moving to the Sanger Institute in 2011. Um, so it's usually the time in this sort of talk where someone like shows you their diverse range of amazing places throughout the world that they've worked. Unfortunately, my uh, range of places isn't quite so diverse and they all fit all of the places I've worked or studied a bit under this red dot on this map. So it's not quite as interesting as a lot of people's career location journeys. Um, so like I said, I started at the Sanger Institute in 2011. Um, and most of my time at the Sanger has actually been spent working on the disease malaria and the malaria program at the Institute. Um, but in the last few years, I moved into human and now synthetic genomics um, in Leopold Partz's lab. So in the Partz lab, we use a variety of techniques to understand how genomes function. Um, so what is a genome? A genome is a complete set of, all, of an organism's genetic instructions. Okay, but how big is the human genome? So that's where we're going to ask you to get involved. Yeah, we've got our first poll. So this will be a good test anyway of our polling function. So I will launch the poll for everybody. Hopefully this will come up um, there. You, you can vote on on how how many letters long you think uh, the, the human genome is. So we've got approximately 3 billion letters long, approximately 30,000 letters long, approximately 3 million letters long, and approximately 300,000 letters long. Um, so I will leave that up just for a couple of minutes just to let you vote. Um, I can sort of respond to how it's looking live. So we've got 75-ish um, percent are saying a billion letters long. We've got a couple saying 30,000 letters long, a couple saying for 3 million. And uh, yeah, a few votes that say 300 thousand. Okay, there's a few more still to participate in the poll, but I will close it in just a second and we can share the share the results. Um, so uh, yeah, as I said, there'll be a few points like this in the talk where we'll throw in some interaction to hopefully, yeah, keep keep everybody on their toes. Um, so let me end the poll and I will share the results. So hopefully you can see. So we've got 67% say uh, approximately 3 billion letters long. Uh, we've got 3% say approximately 30,000 letters long. 27% uh, saying uh, approximately 3 million letters long. And 3% uh, saying uh, approximately 300,000 letters long. So I will stop sharing and allow Garrett to reveal the result. All right. So well done, everyone who put three, about 3 billion. That's about the number. So when my slides fire back up again, they don't they don't like the polls very much, I don't think. Um, there we go. So 3.6 billion bases or roughly is about the size of the human genome. So if you put roughly 3 billion, you are right. So well done. Um, it's really hard. I find it really hard to imagine what 3.6 billion of anything looks like. So um, if you were to print out the human genome on paperback books, that would be about about a thousand books. And but even on the molecular level, um, the DNA in one cell, if you stretch it out into a single line, would be about two meters long, which is also an incredible amount, really. Um, right. So time for another question for you. So everyone who did really well on the last one, um, let's see if you can get this one. Sort this one yeah. out, and then everyone who didn't get it right, here's your opportunity to like make one back. Okay. So, okay, how so big is the human genome compared to other organisms? Yeah, so let me launch this uh, second one. Uh, okay, so this is a new poll that we're styling out for the first uh, for the first uh, uh, season of uh, new season of genomics. Like, hopefully, what you should be able to see is that you can match. Um, some of the options that are being shown here. 
Um, so uh, the options that you can match, so you've got chicken, human, onion, and axolotl. What I want you to do is to say how much bigger or smaller that is in comparison to it, uh, the human genome. So we've got four times the human genome, 0.3 times the human genome, one times the human genome, and nine times the human genome. So I think what you can do is match up those options. As I say, it's a new poll, so we're trialing it out. So hopefully it works for everybody. Um, let me know in the chat if it's uh, not making any sense and uh, we can... Okay, so I'm seeing some results come through. So hopefully that uh, is getting to, uh, yeah, getting um, everybody sort of uh, managing to understand uh, how to do this one. So let's give it a couple more minutes, get everybody to uh, participate in this matching one, and then we'll, we'll get through the, get on to the answers. I'm interested to see how you're all gonna do on this one. <laughs> I hope there's a few surprises. Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, but yeah, so as a, if anyone's still a little bit unclear, there's um, there's sort of four different, uh, well, three different sort of uh, living things, and also the human genome. What we want you to do is to to match up how much bigger or smaller it, it, those those living things are to the human genome, yeah. and you've got some various different options at the bottom. Um, you, you should be able to get one of them right. It's just the <laughs> other one that's tricky. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, let me end the poll. And uh, unless, yeah, unless anyone, anyone who quickly wants to participate, quickly do so now. If not, I will end the poll and uh, move on. So I'll end the poll and then I'll share the results. So can you see those, Gareth? All right. I can. Okay, so I'll read these out. Um, so chicken, uh, we so for people, the chicken breakdown was we've got around about 36% saying that the chicken has uh, four times the, the as a genome, four times that of the human genome. Uh, around about 40% are saying that it's got 0.3 times the, the size of the human genome. Some saying it's the same sort of set length as the human genome. Uh, and uh, again, the same amount saying that it's nine times the human genome. Um, the human one was in there just to get the, hopefully get you used to the, the matching bit of the poll. So yes, so this one is, um, uh, should be one times the human genome. And then uh, we've got the onion. So we've got 44% saying uh, that the onion is four times bigger than the human genome. We've got it around about 40% also saying 0 0.3 times the human genome. Um, and a couple saying nine times uh, the size of the human genome. And then down at the bottom, the axolotl, we've got the breakdown as 24% saying four times, 28% saying 0 0.3 times, 4% uh, uh, saying one times, and 44% saying nine times. Okay, I will stop sharing. Sorry, that was a bit of a mouthful to get through, but hopefully that <laughs> no, all, all clear problem. enough. <laughs> um, so I'll stop sharing. And Gareth, yeah, um, reveal the answers. Right. It might take me a little while to get it all fired up again. Um, but yeah, well done to all of you. It's a tricky one, isn't it? Because um, it's sort of hard to imagine that other organisms might have so many, so much more um, DNA than humans. So if you said chicken was a third of human, that's right. So chicken's genome is about a third of the size of a human genome. Obviously, a human genome is the size of a human genome, so that one is fairly easy, that one. Um, an onion's genome is about four times the size of a human's genome. And incredibly, an axolotl's genome is nine times the size of a human genome, which even when I, when I found that out, I was quite, found that quite incredible. Um, so not that we're biased, but it's easy to think that humans would have the biggest genomes because we're humans. Um, but genome size varies quite considerably between organisms. And the size of a genome isn't necessarily related to complexity. It's more related to insertion, deletion, and integration events that have occurred throughout the evolutionary history of that genome. Um, right. So speaking of the human genome, um, 
22, about 22 years ago, the draft human genome was published and scientists at Sanger and throughout the world played, um, spent 13 years assembling and sequencing the human genome. Um, so it's easy to think, given the way we use instructions in everyday life, that because we're so complicated, because our genome is so big, um, that it's jam packed full of instructions and they're all read in an understandable order, just like, for instance, these Lego instructions are. Um, so in this, if you've ever played Lego, the instructions are all laid out perfectly and you make your Lego frog or your Lego monster like perfectly easily. Um, but our instructions aren't quite like this. Um, like they weren't laid out in a perfect order. They weren't, there were some missing, some parts and weren't quite there um, in the draft genome. And in fact, how our genomes function to make an organism is actually a lot more complicated than simply how the instructions themselves are present in the genome. Um, so that's where we have another quiz for you. Um, can anyone tell me what percentage of your genome is actually instructions or the protein coding genes? This, this is where I'm up again. So yes. let me yeah. let me launch that one for you. So you've got the options of 95%, 50%, 22%, and 1.5%. Um, so yeah, again, the question is, what percentage of the human genome is protein coding genes? We'll give uh, yeah another another minute or so just to yep. get your answers in there, and then we'll we'll get on. Okay, well we've got a range of answers so far, which is great. So that means that we can cool. we can hopefully uh, surprise a few people, which is nice. Um, Okay, so yeah, just if anyone uh, wants to participate in the poll that hasn't done so already, um, give you just a couple more more seconds to do so, um, and then we'll share the share the results. Okay, I'm gonna yeah end the poll there and share the results. So there you go. Oh. So we had uh, eighteen percent say ninety five percent, seven percent say fifty percent, thirty two percent say twenty two percent and 43% say one and a half percent. So the majority went with one and a half percent, but a real, there was a mix in those results. So uh, yeah, Gareth, wow. over to you. Yeah. So yeah, again, it might take a little while to get my, um, <laughs> my slides alive again, uh, but well done if you said one and a half percent, because that's uh, exactly right. Um, and I will show you in a minute. There we go. Um, so yeah, one, just one and a half percent of your genome is actually protein coding genes. Um, the rest is a, a variety of other, other elements. So like intronic regions, um, repetitive regions, miscellaneous sequence and conserved non-coding elements. Um, so that means if you're thinking about instructions again, the way you would our Lego instructions, your Lego instructions would look a bit more like this. So just a few instructions in just a sea of DNA that we don't, re whose function we just don't really know fully what it, it does. Um, so after the genome was sequenced, that led a lot of people to refer um, to this 95 or 90, 99% or 98.5% of, of DNA is junk DNA, which um, is a bit cruel really for the rest of the, the genome. Um, because actually lots of the non-coding DNA in your genome has really important functions and our gene instructions won't do very much at all um, without some of these non-coding regions, things like enhancer regions and promoter regions um, and science regions, they all moderate and control what genes are expressed in what cells at what time. So they're actually really important. And this image gives you another hint to how genome function so again when you think of like instructions in your everyday lives you think of them as like books of instructions or an instruction leaflet everything laid out in a in a, like a linear order um so your the nucleotides in your genome aren't like these books of nucleotides and this, these are actually books of your different volumes of your chromosomes um held at manchester nhs trust they're 
the nucleotides in your genome aren't really uh, held like this in books. They're, it's more like they be printed on a, a building like this. Uh, so your genome exists in 3D space. Um, and because of that, different parts of the genome are specifically located um, much closer to other others. Um, then we call the and this the proximity of different regions of, of DNA to um, other regions um, has quite a, a contributes to the regulation of, of the genes in, in these regions. And we call these topologically associated domains or TADs. Um, not only is 3D space important, like the 3D space that the genome exists in, and the proximity of different areas of the genome to each other. Um, if genes um, in your genome are like books in a library, um, then sometimes just like the long reading room at Trinity Dublin, which this is, is actually closed for refurbishment, bits of your genome um, can be closed. Um, so you can't, the, the genes aren't accessible to the proteins that might express uh, the genetic information from them. Um, so your DNA, obviously that two meters of DNA in your cells is like coiled up because it wouldn't fit in any other way. So it's coiled around proteins called histones and that makes something called chromatin. Um, and chemical modifications on the histone proteins can either open the chromatin up, so you're, like your library is open, or it can close the chromatin and stop genes being expressed from the chromatin, from the DNA. And we call this um, epigenetic regulation. So, um, so the instructions in your genome are only part of the story. How your genome works also depends on how modifications affect your genes. So like the chemical mod modifications of histone proteins. Um, it also depends on the genome's 3D architecture, what parts of the genome are, are in proximity to other parts of the genome. And it also depends on how non-coding features of your DNA function to alter expression levels of your genes. So things like uh, the promoter regions and enhancer regions. So all this adds up uh, to like a symphony of complex interactions that we're like still trying to fully understand. And obviously if we've got complex problems that we're trying to solve, then we need tools to try and work out uh, to try and solve these problems. Okay, and that's where this, these little bacteria come in. Uh, this is like an electron micrograph of a bacteria called Streptococcus pyogenes. Um, and it's given the world two things, a horrible disease called scarlet fever and a revolutionary gene editing tool called CRISPR-Cas9. Um, so CRISPR stands for clustered random interspace short palindromic repeats, which um, apart from being a real mouthful, um, actually gives you a clue uh, to how CRISPR and Cas9 work um, in the bacterial genome. So the, the palindromic repeats are, are part of the bacterial genome and Cas9 works sort of like uh, the bacteria's immune system. Um, so if you're a bacteria, life is pretty tough. Uh, there are loads of other bacteria around trying to compete with you and trying to eat you. Um, but there are also loads of viruses like these, and they're called bacteriophages. And bacteriophages are floating around everywhere, waiting to attach to bacteria, uh, inject um, their DNA into the bacteria, so that uh, then they'll, they'll hijack uh, the bacteria's cellular machinery, fill up the bacteria and new bacteriophages, and then burst them open. So the Cas9 enzyme is like a pair of scissors that's programmed to cut up the bacteriophage DNA um, in a specific manner when it enters the bacterial cell. Um, so this might be a weird time to talk about games consoles, uh, but games console is a bit like Cas9. They both need a specific information to be able to function. So if you have a games console on its own, attached to your television, it's not gonna do anything until you put a specific game into the console. And specific games determine what you can actually do with your, your games console. And it's sort of similar with Cas9. Cas9 on its own will do absolutely nothing. Uh, you need to give it a specific bit of information to be able to function. And we call that a guide RNA. 
So once your cast sign, once your games console has got its game, then you can play just like that with a cast nine. Once you've given it a guide RNA, tells you what part of the DNA, what part of the genome you want it to cut, and then it can go ahead and cut the genome. And obviously, in bacteria, in its native system, um, the Cas9 is programmed by these palindromic repeats to cut up different bacteriophage DNA. Um, but obviously, we can use this system and program the Cas9 with guides that we've designed so it can edit DNA um, that we wanted to in cells that we're growing. Um, so it's time for another poll. So I'd be interested to know how many of you have actually heard of CRISPR before today? I've just quickly launched the poll. So um, uh, we've got, yeah, how, how much have you heard of about CRISPR before today? Uh, yes, I've heard of CRISPR and know what it does. Yes, I've heard of CRISPR, but don't know what it does. And I've never heard of CRISPR before. So uh, this is just helpful just so that, um, yeah, we know know how far to take the next bit uh, and can sort of uh, carry it, carry um, anyone who potentially hasn't heard of it, we can spend a bit more time just going over a little details as well. Um, this might be a nice, if you've not heard of it before, um, it might be a nice opportunity. If you have any questions, um, do make sure you put those questions in the Q&A and we can, we can always get to those um, a little bit later as well. Um, if something that you're not sure about hasn't, hasn't been answered when we go through it in just a second, but yeah. Um, okay, um, I will end the poll there. If anybody wants to quickly submit uh, an answer, do so now. But if not, I will end the poll. Okay, so uh, we've got um, we've got a sort of a split between um, yeah. hearing about it and knowing what it does, but also um, uh, have heard of it, but not actually too sure what it does. And then we've had we've got a few people that, that haven't heard of it before and, and would. Hopefully, like to know more. Um, <laughs> you would like to know more. Anyway, um, that's exactly what we're going to go do. But as I say, if there's anything, any points where um, we you still have questions around what it does, uh, do put them in the Q and A, and we'll we'll get to those uh, later on. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, again, you might have to wait a minute for my slides to come <laughs> again. But yeah, it's interesting to know because CRISPR has become it's such a revolutionary technology it really has sort of uh transformed biology in the last few years so um it's easy to think as someone who works for it that like lots of people know about it but actually it doesn't make it into the news quite as often as you realize um right so yeah so these two scientists emmanuel charpentier on the left and jennifer doudna on the right um, they won the Nobel Prize of, for Chemistry for developing the CRISPR-Cas9 genes editing system in 2020. Um, quite incredibly, they only published their paper about using um, about using the system to edit different genes um, just eight years before they won the Nobel Prize. So that gives you a sort of indication how transformative a technology it's been, and um, you can see here that um, before 2012, when the paper was, first papers were published, there was just no mention of it in the scientific li literature at all. Yet now, like last year, there were more than 7,000 papers that um, mentioned CRISPR or using CRISPR technology um, in the scientific literature. So um, it really has sort of completely transformed the field of genetic engineering. Um, so it's a fantastic tool and we use it a lot but a wide variety of gene editing techniques but um, like all tools um, it's not always perfect so just like a hammer is really useful until you hit your thumb with it um, CRISPR can occasionally cut like in different parts of the genome that you haven't programmed a guide on RNA um, for now we call these off target effects and they can be quite a problem um, when using the CRISPR system to edit genes and also the uh, the Cas9 um, creates double strand 
break in DNA. So like essentially cuts it uh, completely. And, and obviously um, cutting the DNA can be pretty toxic to cells. Um, so just like with your games console, so you can modify your game experience by adding different components to your system. You can add a VR headset, you can add different types of controllers. Um, so over the last few years, uh, lots of different scientists have um, like modified and added um, modifications to, to the Cas9 enzyme and the CRISPR system. Um, and this can change how it works and allows it to potentially mitigate some of the off-target and toxic effects that we get from these double strand breaks. Uh, so one of the systems that we use in our lab is called prime editing where the Cas9 enzyme has been modified so it only nicks the DNA rather than um, causing a double strand break and it's been conjugated, the protein has been conjugated to a different type of enzyme called a reverse transcriptase, and that can print DNA from RNA. Uh, so when you program your, your prime editor, as we call them, with a prime editing guide RNA, um, it will nick the DNA and then it can print new um, DNA from your prime editing guides into the, the space. Um, so that's much less toxic and um, and gives you like a, a, a range of different like options for things you can do um, when when you edit genes. Another system that we have uh, where the, the Cas9 has been modified, um, we put a different enzyme onto it, again a nicking Cas9, uh, where it just uh, breaks like one single strand of the DNA and leaving the other one intact. Um, if we add something called a deaminase, um, in this case a cytidine deaminase, and Give the CRISPR a, a run around like guide RNAs again, uh, rather than cut, double cutting, causing a double strand break to the DNA. Um, a base editing uh, Cas9 will chemically modify the base so they can change a base, say, from a C to a T or an A to a C. Um, so these different systems make it a little bit. Um, broaden our toolkit essentially for the, the range of things we can do and make it you know means we can target things um where a double strand break might be like too difficult to do or too toxic or or lead to like um strange effects okay um so now we've got our toolkit of different cas9 enzymes uh, we can use these to change dna so we can learn more about how our genomes work um, so if you imagine that you had a car and you'd never seen a car before and you wanted to like, you have lots of different ways that you can experiment on that car, see how different parts of it work. For instance, if I take away the air of the car, the car's still going to work. You're not going to be able to listen to the radio, but you can still drive wherever you want and that's fine. However, if I take away the wheels, the car is definitely not going to work. Um, and that tells us something really important about how a car works. So. If you take away the wheels, the wheels are essential to the car. Um, so now we know that we could potentially add loads more wheels to see if that affects the way the car works. Um, we could also add different bits from different cars to see if that changed the way the car works. Or we might even completely flip the car around to see how that um, to see how that changed how the car works. Um, and this might sound a bit silly, but this is all these are all sort of techniques that we use in the lab um, to try and work out how our genomes function. We might overexpress proteins, so we essentially add more wheels. We'll knock out proteins or delete parts of, of the genome to see how it functions. We'll add in different genes from different organisms or even whole chromosomes from different organisms to see how they work in the context of a human cell compared to their, their usual context. And we've also flipped huge sections of the genome in, in chromosomes to see how that functions and see how that affects cellular function. Um, so yeah, so again, it might seem like a silly analogy, but like actually these are the sort of experiments we do every day in the lab to try and really like work out how our genomes function. Um, so yeah, so Today we've learned that your genome isn't just the instructions held in your DNA. Your genome is full of other regulatory information in the form of modi modifications to your DNA, uh, the 3D architecture of your genome, 
how non-coding regions all influence the way those instructions are expressed. And we've also learned a little bit of how our lab is working on all these levels of different regulation to try and understand how this complex interplay unfolds throughout the trillions of cells in your body and in other organisms. Um, so I think with that, I'm done. So thank you all for, for listening and I hope you enjoy. Amazing, thank you, Gareth. And so, yeah, um, now comes on to our sort of Q&A part. So if you have any uh, questions, uh, please do put them in the, the Q&A uh, uh, button um, that you'll see down at the bottom of your, um, your bottom of your screen. Um, yeah, put any questions that you have for Gareth uh, in, the, in the chat there. Um, sorry, in the Q&A button. <laughs> um, and we'll get on to, to those. Um, oh, I've just had, um, uh, I've just ha had a question come through which says, how has the field of genomics and gene editing changed since the advent of NICER? I don't know um, if that's meant to be CRISPR in that regard or, or not, because um, that's something else. Yeah, I've not heard of anything called NICER. So I'm, if I'm assuming you meant, sorry, Ved, I'm, ass, I'm assuming you meant CRISPR and it's also corrected to NICER because it doesn't appear in the dictionary. Um, so I'm going to ask it as if you meant, meant CRISPR or answer it as we meant CRISPR. I mean, CRISPR has really completely transformed um, genetic engineering. Uh, before CRISPR, we did have a few different methods um, for so other nucleases that we could use um, to edit uh, genomes, but they were very slow. They they were effective. So things like um, uh, zinc finger nucleases and another type of nuclease called talons. Um, we could use those, but like to get a zinc finger nuclease to edit a genome, you had to like engineer, um, you had to engineer like a, a specific protein, which might take a very long time, and then it might and be quite expensive, and all of this just to edit a single gene. Uh, now we can do like sort of pulled screens and edit like thousands of genes all at once and to see how that might um, affect genomes. And we can also, like, we can put in lots of different um, other elements that allows us to do things like flip DNA or like excise bits of DNA or integrate different um, different parts of DNA. So it just has expanded our toolbox dramatically and it really has sort of transformed um, the way biology um, can be done. So yeah, thank you for your question. Um, I think Toby's next, yeah? Uh, yes, so yeah, in base editing, how does this affect the hydrogen bonding as the edited base may no longer be complementary? So um, that's sort of exactly how it works. So because it's not um, complementary, your, um, your cells have a range of different methods that they can repair um, mistakes in your, in your DNA, essentially. So, um what you have specific proteins in your um in your cells that will spot this mismatch and note that they're not complementary and then they will excise um excise the base that isn't complementary and um replace it with the one that is so um so yeah obviously um in some of like um, so in some of the cases, like the one that you've edited will get excised or like change. And in other cases where the edits occurred, it will, it will change. So you get sort of a mixed population. Um, yeah, good question. Um, thank you, Ved. That's another good one. Um, so Ved's asked, what's your own research focused on? Um, so my role in the lab isn't so much, uh, to generate my own research. I work for other people and actually really like that because I I like I think you know one of the reasons I do things like this like the public engagement and and my role in the lab is that I you know I enjoy working with others and contributing to their science and helping sort of like 
push them forward essentially um, but at the moment in particular i'm working on using prime editing uh, to delete uh, large regions of dna up to like sort of a million uh sort of a megabase dna and seeing how seeing what happens as a result um so we've got this really lovely system where we have a gene which we've inserted in um something called an an m scarlet gene so m scarlet's like if you um put m scarlet into a cell it like glows red essentially um so what we do we've got the cell line which is red and we then delete this region uh, with the m scarlet in uh, at different sizes so like to take the m scarlet out it's a few hundred base pairs and that's fine but then we try and um go further away and further away and further away and seeing how far we can actually push the system um how much we can delete before it sort of stops really working and falls down and at the moment we sort of successfully managed to delete up to about a million base pairs in some cells so it's working surprisingly well and that's for the prime editing and and it's yeah it's really good so yeah thank you for your questions yeah. I, I just have a quick uh, a question, uh, Gareth, which is yep. just uh, as a layperson in this conversation, uh, um, when, how, how are you actually doing this in the lab? And like, what, what are you, what are you, as you said, you sort of have some cells and you're, yep. you're sort of going in there to do it. Just explain a little bit more about that, that actual raw process of what you're doing. Because I, I can imagine to yeah, some, of course. it's quite yeah. hard to imagine um, what that actually looks like. Yeah, so we grow cells like in the dishes in the first picture um, in the lab, and they will like naturally sort of form like a monolayer across the base and thing of the of your dish. Um, so then you can get DNA or and DNA into those cells in lots of different ways. So these this cell line we have that's red also already has um, a prime editor in it, so the Cas9 in it. So all we need to do is put in the um prime editing guide rnas to allow and then we have like a, a molecular switch on the prime editor so we give it this chemical called doxycycline it turns the switch on so uh our cells that are red start expressing um the the prime editor cas9 uh we then do something called a transfection so we transfect the cells and that essentially means putting DNA into the cell and there are lots of different ways uh, that we can do that but one of the easiest is essentially called it's called lip affection and it's essentially like putting DNA inside a tiny bubble of, of fat of like detergent sort of molecules and then those detergent molecules obviously when they hit the cell membrane because cell membranes sort of essentially made of detergent molecules um, it then sort of merges with it and pops the DNA or the pair in this case the prime editing guide RNAs into the cell. So then our prime editor can work and by with those guide RNAs we can program it where we want it to to edit. Um, and so we have one uh, by our M scarlet and then one at, at very points further away from it. And they edit at each side and make like a, a flap essentially um, that then either gets um, excises this this piece of DNA or it like repairs itself to remove that edit um, but yeah we're creating sort of fairly good rates of the edits actually occurring so so yeah and uh, and so all of this is just to 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 further our understanding of, of obviously how how our genome works and you specifically work on on the human genome is that correct or is it um yeah do you um, sometimes do any comparison stuff with any other living organism um so there is potentially talk that we might do that in the in the future a little bit but like mainly we work on human cells and and human cell lines um we have got a cell line at the moment which is a human cell line with one chicken chromosome in it um so when i talked about the example of the cars where you can take bit like take a car and and add bits from a different car we've taken a chicken chromosome and managed to get it into um, a human cell and that cells like continued to grow which is quite remarkable and we're look, currently looking at um, how the expression levels of the genes have changed and how 
the context, you know, the, the quite considerably different cellular context changes the way that, that um, how that chromosome sort of operates. So, but yeah, and it's so, quite remarkable and, that that yeah. it even survived. If you got to ask, but. And in terms of what the, and what is this understanding allowing us to, to better so what what is what is knowing all of these different bits and trying these different uh, different options what is that sort of what's the far future aim by having this information um i think in the long term by understanding how the genome works like there are lots of different sort of applications you know like translational applications obviously um when you think about diseases, there are a lot of there's sort of genetic risk factors for a number of diseases, and um, there, you know, in, in particular, things like cancer are obviously an example of like quite a catastrophic sort of breakdown of of, of function in a cell. Um, so yeah, by understanding more about our um, our research on a more fundamental level, um, but like hopefully by understanding the fundamentals of genome function we can then like other groups could apply this to um to more translational areas so like you know disease and, and medicine for example and yeah we've got a couple of questions just come in yeah. there that i think potentially touch upon some of those bits you were mentioning so we've got yeah. um so uh, beds asked where do you think crispr and gene editing could advance in the next decade or so and i think you touched upon some of the technologies that have sort of started to come from yeah so things like base editing and prime editing are, are sort of really fairly new like prime editing is only a few years old really so um you're very much in a, a phase of sort of optimizing it and seeing how it works but there are a number of like companies at the moment that have been spun out as a result of of work on base and prime editing um I think the reliability of it and the fact that like off target effects are so dramatically reduced means there are um there is a lot of scope for like treating sort of genetic diseases. So um for instance, things like um like sickle cell, um things like cystic fibrosis potentially. I mean part of the problem like with all this stuff though is actually editing getting your edits and your editing machinery into a cell in a human body is is the biggest barrier i think but the technology in terms of gene editing is is really sort of advancing all the time but yeah i think more more translation more you can see more things sort of going into clinic will be the be the the big change in the next sort of decade or so yeah, yeah. and it's worth um it's worth saying um us as an as uh, welcome connecting science we've actually um uh we've run a what's known as a citizen's jury on gene editing and around the the germline gene editing so any gene edits at a stage that meant that it would be passed on down into generations and sort of understanding where those that have lived experience of genetic conditions can what their views are on 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 whether or not um, they think that our government should start having conversations around gene editing in that sense as well. So there are obviously really serious ethical considerations, especially mm -hmm. around um, certain certain forms of gene editing. But then, as you say, something like sickle cell anemia being able to to sort of in in the sense of uh, stop that condition and, and disease is is yeah, it's a really interesting conversation to to have. Mm -hmm. I think as well. We've got a lot, uh, quite a few little questions coming in, so I yep. want to make sure we get to those because we've only got uh, eight minutes left. So uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I will, I will run the, run through them quickly. So we've got one that said, "Could we learn from animals to help prevent cancers? E.g., elephants have lots of copies of p53 and do not get cancers. Could we add p53 copies to the human genome?" Um, I mean, I guess we could. Um, I don't know if we'd fully know the implications of, of doing that. Um, the question, obviously, P53 is mutated quite often in, in human cancer. Um, 
but like I, I don't think you could like would we know for certain that it would prevent human cancer by any more more copies of it to our cells or would that have other implications I mean like again just editing human cells it's very difficult and if you wanted to add more copies of p53 53 to all your cells in your body to prevent cancer you'd have to do it to all of them so it would be incredibly difficult to do and incredibly risky too because i'm not sure you'd really know the implications of doing that but yeah um but yeah people do use like animal models of animals that don't get cancer to try to find out a bit more about how humans get cancer and other animals get cancer too so for instance things like uh, naked mole rats are quite a popular one they um they don't get cancer at all and live for an incredibly long age um but yeah trying to understand how and why cancer affects different organisms um is really interesting and lots of people do do use like model organisms like in you know other animals that don't appear to get cancer um it'd be quite tri quite difficult to use elephants as a model organism i think but um uh, yeah thank you for that gareth yes yes um so just i think we've got a couple more um uh i'm just going to go to andrew's question yep. first so it says how do you identify the genes you want to study in a specific chromosome um so yeah so obviously uh when the human genome draft human genome was published we had um a lot of it we didn't really know um what it did but like there are lots of genes that we are we do know what they did and obviously in the last 20 or so years there have been a num like more efforts to fill in the gaps and to the point where i think earlier in the year like a human pan genome was published um so wasn't just based on one individual it's based on a range of like different people different ethnic backgrounds and and lots of diversity to try and um see like how um like see the diversity of of the genome essentially um so we know a lot about the genes in in humans and where they are and so it's easy enough to look up online like on a number of like tools online to work out where a gene is how like what sequences you can download its sequence you can then work out where you might want to edit um the crispr guide rna has to have something called um a protospace adjacent motif or a pam site um in front of it so and that sequence is n so it for any nucleotide and then a g and a g so you, you can't edit everywhere but you you are like slightly constrained by having to have this pan sequence before your your guide but yeah um so yeah there's lots of information available because of the fact that we you know we sequence human genome the genes are there and we can find their sequences and then and use that information okay amazing and then yeah there's just another question which kind yeah. of touches upon a little bit what we touched about yeah, about the yeah. ethical implications so um uh, how much of a problem to the field has been posed by societal stigmas towards gene editing? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm not entirely sure. Um, how much of a problem it it's. I guess yeah, as you, I, as, I guess, yeah, no, go on. I guess as you as uh, as researchers as well, in terms of like, and working on this stuff, obviously yeah. you, you guys need to, we will be working within sort of ethical frameworks, I can yeah. imagine. But yeah. I obviously um, this, when I, when the technology was released, there was the, yeah. sort of what you might be sort of some of the, what this might come from as well is in the news, obviously there was that, uh, case where uh, gene editing was used on on two twins to like, sort of remove what was deemed the gene of um uh hiv um, yeah. and that was sort of against the law and it's against the law in this country to do something like that yeah. but that was done in china and um 
it was uh, yeah sort of shocked the world a little bit into because it was just the, the the results were announced at the international summit of gene editing yeah um, can't remember which year it was now but 2019 I think um, uh, which kind of shocked the world a little bit in terms of realizing that as much as the technology is there there's obviously all of the ethical implications and and you touched upon it Gareth as well didn't you around it's not a hundred percent accurate so the effects yeah, yeah. That you don't know what's gonna gonna happen so I can imagine that that probably didn't help um, yeah. society in terms of uh, concerns yeah. around that but it's it's always worth um, and this is why we do these these types of events yeah, is that yeah. it's worth, worth hosting and having questions and being able to talk through things to be able to make sure that you know voices around different these different things are, are heard I, I yeah. I think it's really important. Um, but yeah, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add to that one, Gareth. No, I think that that's good. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I I must admit it's not something I sort of really think about day to day because like you said, the framework's already in place at the Institute. And so all of our um you know, we have a biological safety assessment and things like that. So we know that what we're doing isn't doesn't isn't going to breach ethical guidelines or anything like that so yeah cool yeah. amazing i'm just conscious of the time and we've only got yep. a minute left so yeah. i <laughs> i just want to quickly touch upon one about your career journey which was that you yep. went from accountancy into retraining yes just to anyone that potentially might be watching that is always imagined the idea of maybe retraining in this type of field or anything like that how was that experience for you and yeah, what was that trigger potentially that sort of caused yeah. you to, to sort of think about things again? I don't know. I mean, I always really enjoyed science and I enjoyed it at school and studied at A level, but it just felt like I, I wasn't really sure at the end of end of school which direction I wanted to go in, and I sort of yeah thought I'd try something different. And but like I'd spend my lunch breaks going and buying science books and things like that and that was sort of took me a while to my like to catch up with what I was doing and, and what I sort of really enjoyed doing so um yeah I had I mean I had the opportunity I guess to, to take redundancy and at that time and it felt like rather than a problem it felt like an opportunity so it you know it felt like the opportunity you know that I needed I can go back to uni and and study what I actually really enjoyed and it was quite nice to go that way too because I, I think I probably did better at university than I might have done if I'd gone from school because I went and I treated it like a job and you know I was in the library at eight and I left the library at five and <laughs> sort of like you know um sort of kept you know just sort of treated it like that and but yeah, I'm really glad I did it. And I've had the opportunity to work on so, so much amazing science and contribute so many like amazing projects over the years. It's been a real privilege. So I'm really glad I made that decision. But, yeah. And amazing. And on that, on that sort of note of positivity in, in <laughs> sort of in, in, in that. Um I yeah, I want to say thank you to Gareth for, for speaking with us this afternoon and thank you to you all for joining us uh, on our genomic slide. Um, I'm just going to quickly put in the chat um, our events newsletter. Um, this is how you sign up to our future genomic slides. That's how they will be advertised. So if you aren't um, a member of our events newsletter, do sign up. Um, that way um, we, uh, we can uh, yeah, advertise um, that you can get the latest genomic slides. Uh, to your email but yeah do sign up if um if you aren't uh, uh, a sort of a member of our newsletter um and yeah so just a final thank you to gareth for, for the, the fantastic talk and uh yeah thank you to you all for, for watching so yeah this is the end of our genomics slide, and uh, i look forward to seeing hopefully some of you at the next session um but yeah thank you for joining thank you